week, we're going to be uh, talking about something that, that I, for me, has actually become something that is, is something that I, I, has become pretty near and dear to my heart. Um, and how many of you all have ever heard of IQ? Okay. Everybody in the room just got scared because they think I'm going to give them a test. No, that's not actually what we're talking about. I'm talking about EQ, emotional intelligence. So there's IQ, if you didn't know, it's called the intelligent quotient. And emotional intelligence is very similar, but also very different. Reasons, and, and we're going to unpack this, and I'm, you're probably going to see me preach a little differently today because there's going to be a lot of times where I'm just going to teach you about some things. And then I'm going to unpack some scripture where we can, where we can find, we can find a, a specifically a person that dealt with this drastically. And you might be going, why in the world are we dealing with mental health? First of all, it's Mental Health Awareness Month, and so I think it's a wonderful opportunity to um, kind of uh, take, take the swing on a, the ball on a team, right? It, it's an opportunity to, to, to hit the ball out of the park. And so um, this month, we want to give you some tools. We want to we help you out because uh, with mental health, it can, it can leave you in a spot that's feeling disconnected, a spot that, that leaves you trapped, a spot that feels like you're held captive in your own brain. And, and then what I want to do is I want to give you the tools to overcome that. I want to give you the tools that can, that can give you the thing that you need most. And so as believers, I believe that we have to start right off with our key scripture. It's found in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 19. It says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. This is Jesus reading uh, the scroll of Isaiah. And he had just been out in the wilderness. He was just tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. And, and he was put through the ringer. He was put through the test. And he, he gets out of the wilderness and immediately goes to church. And they hand him a scroll, and lo and behold, it, it was, it was the, the, the scroll of Isaiah. And what he read was this. It says, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You see, what we see here is that um, in this, Jesus was reading what was being prophesied hundreds of years before he came. Isaiah was a, was a major prophet in the Old Testament. And hundreds of years before he came, Isaiah prophesied that there would be a person that came because he, he, was, he had the Spirit of God on him. And what he was going to do is he was going to set prisoners free. He was going to give them freedom to prisoners he was going to set the oppressed free, and he was going to give sight to the blind. I don't know about you that have ever dealt with anything mental health related. Maybe it's anxiety. How many of y'all have ever had anxiety a time or two? What about any, anybody that would say that they've maybe dealt with depression at all? Wonderful. I'm not saying that your depression is wonderful. I'm glad that you are responding. And, and so what, what we see here is that some of those times we see that, that when we get in an anxiety attack, sometimes we feel like we're held captive. Sometimes we feel like prisoners because of our own head, what's in our mind, the voice that's in our head that's talking to us, the voice that's telling us, you're not good enough, you can't, you can't get over this, you, you can't do this, or you can't do that. When in reality, that's not what God says about us. We talked last week about how we, we all have a sound. We get to determine who and what that sound sounds like. We get to, to, to determine if it's, if it's us echoing the voice of God in our life, or if it's our own head that's talking to ourselves, which is not good, generally. If it's someone else that we allow to speak into us, and how they affect us. See, what we do is, is we take what people say, we believe it, and then we start behaving that way. If people say that we aren't good enough, <coughs> shortly we'll start believing and acting like we're not good enough. We'll start believing that, that uh, 
I know I've never been good enough because uh, that's all I've ever been told. I, I think that some of the things that, uh, some of the phrases that you hear is, well, I've always been told that I'm never going to fill in the blank. Or I've always been told that I'm going to have this issue because my mom had this issue. You can end that. you gotta, you got to put a stop to that. And, and so today, as we walk through this, uh, this emotional intelligence, I, I'm going to throw up a, a graph um, on the screen for you real quick. There's five components, if you would, to emotional intelligence. Um, and you can't really see them. I was worried about that. So I'm going to read them to you. It's self-awareness is number one. Social awareness, self-regulation, empathy, and motivation. What self-awareness is, is that's, that's what it says. Is you, you know who you are. You know yourself. You know your emotions. You're able to recognize the emotions that are found within the side of your head and in, in who you are. What make you. That social awareness and the skills for social the, the social ability skills that, that all of us have, maybe better than others, maybe not. Um, you're aware of, of the people that you deal with. You're, you're aware and, and, and you're able to manage the relationships that you get in. Every day we have the opportunity to create and build relationships. The exact opposite, every day we have the ability to destruct and destroy relationships. So how we manage our relationships is crucial to our social awareness. Self-regulation, that is how we, we manage our emotions and how we allow what the emotions of someone else to impact us. That's, that's the self-regulation. Empathy. How many of you all know what empathy is? Anybody? Perfect. Wonderful. I can tell you what it is. It's actually understanding and identifying with someone else's stuff. And I say stuff because it could be emotions. It could be problems. It could be concerns. It could be circumstances. But you understand and you identify with the things that someone else is going through. Lastly is motivation. And this one's really neat. <laughs> Because it's one of the ones that is so different than the other, but I think it plays a big part into the other four. It's, it's motivation is being motivated because you love what you do. You see, some people, I'm going to talk about that a little bit tonight uh, with, our, with our boys and, and their families. But one of the things that, that I, I, I can remember I can remember trying to figure out where, what I was supposed to do in life, who I was supposed to be, what, what, what job I was supposed to be, what career I was supposed to go into. I don't know if you all know this or not, but I, I, I went to college thinking that I was going to be a nurse anesthetist. I mean, that would be nice. That would be really, really nice. I ended college because I realized... But I like to have too much fun. I graduated with an agriculture degree. And now, here I sit. But I can tell you that the motivation is because I love doing what I do. That it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily matter what the title is. It doesn't necessarily matter what I make. It matters that I love what I do. And I, I began to realize when I stepped in the ministry, everybody asked, they said, well, they said, Brandon, how is it going? Is it different? Do you love it? Well, this is such a big change. I mean, I, I threw people off, especially my friends in college. I, I mean, I threw them off. And I said, you know what? It's the best job that I've ever had. It's not a job. I think it's the motivation. You see, when you love something so much that it's not a job to you, you continue to do it. I've said before that if I could find something else to do, I would do it in a heartbeat because this is a job, this is a, this is a calling in my life, that if I can think of anything else to do, I better go do it. But guess what? I can't think of anything else because I've done so many other things. And this is where God has called me, and this is what He has called me to do. And so... That is part of being 
emotionally intelligent. And so today I, I, I want to give you some tools. If you're taking notes, be sure to write these down. Um, I'm a big believer in assessments. Heather's in the room. She's one of our interns this year. She has taken a few of these assessments. And uh, one, our whole, um, our whole internship class and our whole staff has been um, challenged with taking one of these in the last couple of weeks. And it's all about leading in your strengths. You know, what does leading in your strengths have anything to do um, with emotional intelligence? If you'd like to find that, it's on, in a, let me get to the actual website, Ministry Insights. And the, the actual assessment is called Leading from Your Strengths. But what it does is it, is it pulls apart some of the things you're good at, some of the things you're not so good at. And it shines a bright light on both of them. To start working through emotional intelligence, you have to be okay with the truth. I'm just going to start there. Because this assessment, one of the things that I, I, I talked about when I took the assessment was, that's really scary, first of all. The test is super easy. It's probably one of the easiest tests because there's not a pass or fail. But it's all about you. It's all about what makes up the person that you are. And, and so what it does is it, it kind of maps out who you are and, and, and puts you in a category. And if you've ever heard of, uh, let's see, you've got the lion, you've got an otter, you've got a golden retriever, and to help me out here. You don't remember, do you? No, it's okay. I'm an otter. Um, so that's, that's where I sit, and um, what it is is it, it's all about if you're, if you're task-oriented or people-oriented and, and all of that good stuff. But what it, what it does is, is so, so you get this, it paints this picture. And like I said, there's good things that it paints, and there's yeah, not so good things it paints. But even the bad things that it said, I was like, oh, I can, I can totally see that. I, I can see myself doing some of those things that I fall back to. And, and so, so finding out who you are is crucial to emotional intelligence. The other, the other one is actually a book. I, I, I would say that anybody, that if they want to find out about themselves, that at any point in time they're leading anything. If you're leading your household, if you're leading a business, if you're leading something, you should read this. It's a book called Overcoming the Dark Side of Leadership by Gary L. McIntosh. The dark side of leadership is what you naturally go back to. I'm not talking about Star Wars here. But the dark side of leadership is, is, is maybe what your crutch is. Like if something happens, or, or you're trying to problem solve, or you're trying to, um, to uh, or conflict resolution. That's a big one that sometimes people fall back on a crutch. And sometimes our crutches aren't necessarily good for us. Even though for us, we tend to think they are because, as I mentioned, um, I think last week, is that our brains, one of the number one things that our brain is, is meant to do is it's meant to regulate our body. It's meant to keep us comfortable. It may, it, the, the sole job of our brain is to protect us. And so when something happens to get us out of comfort, the brain goes, whoa, 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 whoa. Red flags go flying and, and it starts putting up the, the, the flashers because this is not supposed to happen. And, and so what we do is we fall back to a crutch that allows us to be comfortable instead of leading as God called us to lead and so, if anybody's in a, in a position would like to like to do that, if, if you if you need to borrow the book, I've got the book. I would I would be more than happy to let you borrow it. But both of these, what they do, is they get down to the to where the baseline is the real you. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're talking about we're going to talk about three things that I believe that will help you um, improve. Your emotional intelligence. So first thing, if you're taking notes, write this down. You've got to be honest with yourself. Somebody say, ooh. Yeah. 
I think sometimes it's a lot easier to be honest with somebody else than honest with yourself. You see, emotional intelligence, what we, what we see is, is that the difference between IQ and EQ is that IQ is the know-how, EQ is the know-you. That's the difference. And so what I hope from today is, and I, I hope that when we open up this can of an emotional intelligence, that we all begin to get to know the us that maybe we don't currently know. Sometimes that can be scary. Sometimes that can be things where we have to walk through uh, some emotions, some, some tough times, because we're finding things out that, oh, I, I don't really act that way, or I don't really, I don't really do that, or I don't, I don't really fall back to that sort of crutch. And so we have to be honest with ourselves. And if we're not willing to be honest with ourselves, then, then to be really honest, that's where the whole thing starts. And if we're not willing to be honest with ourselves, then we can't follow the rest of the, of the direction that we have to go. You see, we have to be um, self-aware. We have to be, um, we have to have those self-regulation components. Remember the five components that go into emotional intelligence. Well, being honest with yourself is being one, self-aware, and two, having self-regulation. And so, uh, I need somebody that is willing to maybe get picked on a little bit uh, to come up to the stage. Anybody? 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 There we go. We're saying, perfect. Wonderful. I was going to pick if no one walked up here. Come on. I'm not going to pick on you too bad. I've got two questions for you. We're going to see how how you do with this test, okay? First question is, what is something that you change about yourself? But his question was, Brandon, can you preach? I thought, 
for a second. He says, I just asked you if you can preach. So, well, yeah, I can preach. He says, okay, good. I just want to know that you can preach. And it's really that simple. It's as simple as just asking yourself, what am, what am I great at? Am I great at being a mom? Am I great at being a dad? Believe me, this weekend, whew, I don't know if that's true. Um, but I, am, I, I guarantee you, if I have so much respect for every single parent in the room. Because I had my two boys for 24 hours all by myself. <laughs> and, uh, What is something that we are great at? And this morning, you're probably going, are we ever going to actually dive into the Bible? Yes, we are, and this is where we're getting to it. So remember, number one, you have to be honest with yourself. When we go into the, the, second, the second portion of this, is where we're going we're to dive into a, a story. And it's a story about two men, and really a whole kingdom, if you would, that... If you've been in church at any bit of length of time in your life, you've probably heard about them. King Saul and David. You all with me? King Saul and David? Perfect. And I'm not talking about the Saul that became Paul. I mean, the Saul in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel. So we're going we're gonna to walk through quite a bit of text here in the next few little minutes. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn uh, to 1 Samuel chapter 15. Um, if not, it's going to be up on the screens for you. And, and we're just gonna we're gonna really walk down through this. We're gonna unpack some of the stories of Saul um, because one of the things that I can tell you, I'm gonna give you a little hint into where we're going, is that Saul dealt with this very poorly. <laughs> he had an emotional intelligence, and so I want to make sure that people leave today with emotional intelligence. We see the other side of the story. We have King Saul and we have David, who eventually became king. We see one guy handle it very poorly. And we're going to see another guy that handled it very, very well. We know that both messed up. Both had some big errors. But the difference in how they handled the emotions in the situation, how they handled their relationships, how they managed the stuff that they went through, that's what changed the outcome of one to the other. And so this morning, we're going to dive into, in, into the story of King Saul. And one of the things I'm going to talk about real quick is the fact that I think there's four O's in leadership. And I think it's what, what Saul dealt with. And, it, and it's just where his, his kind of downfall started with. And it's the four O's. There's opportunity, opposition, obedience, and outcome. And you're going to see uh, that each of these kind of come to play in the story that we're about to read. So opportunity at hand was, first and foremost, he was the very first king of Israel, chosen by God, anointed by the prophet Samuel. So that's, I mean, that's, if we're starting out, he, is, he has a huge opportunity he is God's chosen one. He is the one that, that, that is chosen to lead God's people. And in 1 first, first Samuel 15, verse 3, this is where we pick up this story. It says, Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have done. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Everyone, annihilate them. Then we get to verse 7. And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. See, the Bible's really something. It throws in these little things, in these little context clues. See, why God was wanting to destroy the Amalekites was because they were horrible to the Israelites as they were leaving Egypt back in Exodus. And so we see that God's finally going to have his moment with them. 
he, he, he's putting Saul in charge of the army of God saying, hey, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go through my, you know, this is the plan that I have in place. This is what we want. In verse 8, it goes on. And it says that he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction, all the people with the edge of the sword. So he saved the king. What did God tell him to do? Destroy him. Destroy everything. But we see right off the bat, he saved the king. But Saul and the people spared Agag and, and, and the best of the sheep and of the oxen of the fatted calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. The word of the Lord came to Samuel. Remember, he's still a prophet. And the word of the Lord came and it said, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Saul was angry and he cried to the Lord all night long. So the second thing for us, if we're going to have emotional intelligence, is that we have to be honest with others. We have to be honest with the people that are around us. 1 Samuel 15, verses 13 to 15, where the story goes on. And Saul, immediately, when Samuel came to him, Saul said, How many of you all, how many of you all have ever seen a parent coming and you know what you're getting in trouble for, so you try to make sure the story sounds good before they even ask you about it? This is what Saul did when he saw Samuel coming. Saul said, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. This is great. Listen, listen, and, I, and almost listen to the humor that you find in Samuel here. And Samuel said, What then is the bleeding of sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen that I hear? Do you not know that you've messed up? I, I, I hear the sheep, dude. I, I hear the oxen that you, that you took. God told you to annihilate all of them, and you're trying to tell me that you, you followed all of his commandments. Verse 15, it goes on, and Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people, big thing here, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. So we see the king, God's chosen person, says, Oh, it wasn't me, I followed all the rules, it was them. They did it. Camden is getting into a bad habit of when something happens, it is immediately Tucker's problem. <laughs> immediately. Well, Tucker did it. I didn't do it. Tucker made the mess. I didn't do it. I don't have to play him. Oh, yes, you do. And, and, and so what we see then is a very crucial, crucial part of the story. Because we see where Saul sees himself. Verse 17, it says, And Samuel said, Though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has anointed you king over Israel. So Samuel puts him in his place and goes, Whoa, 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 whoa! Just because you see yourself as a little person doesn't mean that God hasn't placed you in the spot as king. So for us, there's probably times when we've thought of ourselves as something that God has not thought of us as. Maybe it's someone that says, I'm not good enough. When God says, no, 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 you were perfectly and wonderfully made. You were, I, I, I made you in my own image. You, you were good in God's eyes. It doesn't matter what someone else says about you. It doesn't matter what someone else thinks about you. He, he, he created you and you were good. Verse 19 to 23. We kind of get to the end of this. And it says, Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? This is, this is Samuel speaking this to Saul. Why did you pounce on the spoil and, and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? 
And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord had sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of the Amalek. I have devoted the Amalek and Amalekites to destruction. Here it is again. But the people took up the spoil, the sheep and the oxen. The best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God. You see, he was even given a second chance to say, I messed up. Ah, forgive me. I, I, I did wrong. But as the king, he goes, no, 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 no. I, I, did, I did all the things I did right. I took the army, we captured them, we, 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 we conquered them. But, but oh, the people, the other people that were with me, they're the ones that did it. And he, he passed the blame onto somebody else. And Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of the rams. He's saying that God desires your heart to be obedient to his rather than all of the stuff. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Ouch. So we see in a moment, in just a moment, we have a guy who was thinking I am on top of this mountaintop moment. We talked about it last week. Sometimes when our mountaintop moments happen, the, the rock bottom is, is surely to come. But the reason, the reason why is because when we're on our mountaintop moment, we decide to create a monument for ourselves. And what ends up happening is, is when we create a monument for ourselves and don't create a monument for God, we don't act out of our strength. Or we're acting out of our strength and in our weakness, not through God's strength. That's the difference. That's the emotional intelligent part. Now, there is a whole list of things that happens following this. Once this happened, God went to, had Samuel, and he said, Samuel, I need you to go to the house of Jesse in Bethlehem, and I need you to anoint a new king. He said, um, who? And he said, it, it's the son of Jesse. That's what he told him. So he went to Jesse's house. Jesse had eight sons. The youngest of eight, finally. They brought him in from the, from the field to sheep. This is the one. David. He was anointed that day as the king. He had to wait for a while for his appointment to be king. Through that time, God did some things inside of David. We know that David is, is often referred to as, as a man after God's own heart. I think sometimes as human nature, we go, how? Because as humans, we probably go to his one mess up with Bathsheba. The difference is, is when, when, when David had a mess up, compared to when Saul had a mess up, he took the blame. David said, I messed up. I messed up in the eyes of the Lord. I, I'm the one that did wrong. Not, oh, it was her fault. If it was Saul, that's what would have happened. No, it was her fault. She shouldn't have been, she shouldn't have been on, on the roof. She shouldn't have been in the bathtub. Yeah. Y'all have seen Veggie Tales, right? That's what, how it happened. And so, so, so what we see is that there's two different ways to approach a wrong. There's a right way and a wrong way. And we see that because Saul messed up and, and didn't ever get it right, we see this, this shift. And it's a shift that happens just in our lives as well. It is, it is when we mess up and we don't go to God and say, God, I messed up. We begin a spiral that's downhill. 
We begin this spiral that no matter, no matter how bad we want to, no matter how bad we want to stop it, if we don't go to God, the spiral won't ever end until we hit bottom. That's what takes us to the next point. Is that we have to be honest with God. We have to be honest with ourselves. We have to be honest with each other. And we have to be honest with God. You see, what ended up happening with Saul is, is that throughout this whole thing, the spiral effect ended up happening because then he began to see David as a threat. He began to get jealous. He began to be filled with pride. And I don't know about you all, but how many of you all were ever taught that pride was the root of all evil? And, and, and generally, pride comes before a what? A fall. That's right. And, and, and so what we see is that, that the pride built up in Saul. The Spirit of God left him. Relationships began to fall all around him. The ones that were close, the ones that weren't close, they, were, they left. Multiple times, David was brought in. What, what David was before he was brought in as the, the, the mighty man by one of the army officials, he, was, he played the harp. He sat in Saul's courts and played the harp because Saul was tormented in his mind because of the Spirit of God had left him. Don't, don't miss that. It was not the Spirit of God that was tormenting his brain. It was because the Spirit of God left him that he was left tormented. Don't, don't mess that up. And so, 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 so David would sit there and play the harp to, to, to soothe Saul, to make him feel better, to make him, to, to make him feel like he was worthy again. Multiple times in that act, Saul would take his spear, and I, I love, I love the verbiage that the Bible uses. He said that he tried to pin him to the wall with his spear. Twice, on two different occasions, he did this. He missed. David dodged the spear and he got out and he was able to flee. We see multiple times David was, was offered, offered Saul's daughter in marriage. And he, one of the, the first time was that, was that he was offered his, his first daughter. And Saul went on and said, if, if, if you go and you kill all the Philistines and you defeat the Philistine army, you can have my daughter. He was not thinking that I'm actually going to do this. He was thinking that. They would be killed, and I wouldn't have to do it, and the blood of David would not be on my hands. He went and did it, and didn't give him his daughter. So he said it again. He said, Well, I'll give you my other one. You go and give me proof. He went and got proof of killing not only a hundred, but two hundred. He went and got proof, and he still did it. And what we see is that there was a there was a relationship that was formed between Jonathan and David. It was a David, it was a relationship that was closer than brothers. Jonathan was Saul's son. Saul even lied to his own son when he said, Son, I'm, I'm done. I will no longer try to kill David. And yet again, his own emotional intelligence took the best of it. Emotional intelligence took the best of it. Tried again and again and again. And every single time, every single time he would try, David was right there. He would honor him as the king. All the way to the final day of Saul, when Saul eventually took his own life. And he was killed in, 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 in the battle. And, and, and so what you see is that David, even down to the very end, David mourned the loss of Saul. Because of the, as the king, and that's what people did. They would have mourned the loss of their king. And David did that. Even down to the end, he honored him as the king. Knowing rightfully, oh goodness, my time is coming. I'm about to be appointed as the next king. He did it all with honor. I, I can't help but imagine because it was that 
David was not only honest with himself, not only honest with the people around him, but he was honest with God. You see, when we're honest with God, our decision-making is shifted. The way that we perceive things is shifted. I said earlier that, that as believers, one of the things that we get to do, one of the things that, that we see that shifts is that we stop acting out of our own weakness when we put ourselves in the center. And when we put God in the center, we are able to act out of His strength. See, at the end of the day, that's why we started. That's why, that's why we started out the series. That's why our, our key scripture with the series is simply the fact that Jesus came to free the captives. To give freedom to the prisoners. To, to give sight to the blind. Because it, it doesn't have anything to do with us. It's, it's not what we can do in our own strength. One of my favorites is that in our weakness, Jesus may be strong. He is made strong through our weakness. It's not the fact that we are weak. It's the fact that we are able to put ourselves lower than him. But when we try to put ourselves above him, that's when we get things all mixed up. So I want to leave you with this. How, I've just got some questions for you. How do we improve our emotional intelligence? How do we improve it? One, you start out with being honest with yourself. You start being honest with others. You've got to be honest with God. Right, that's where it has to happen. How do we live our lives with Christ at the center? How do we make that shift? I can't answer that because I don't know where, where each of you all sit. If I had to guess, I bet there's people in this room that would go, you know what, I'm, I'm not necessarily living with God at the center right now. I bet there's people in the room right now that would say, I need to be honest with God. I, I need to be honest. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not being honest with myself. I'm not being honest with others. But I'm definitely not being honest with God. If that's anybody this morning, please take this moment. The next few minutes, we're going to take communion. We're going to get to see how God was made to be the center of everything. See, communion is just that. It, it shows how, how through us, we don't have the power to make change. We don't have the power to, to be saved through our works, through our actions, through the stuff that we say, but it's through what Jesus did on the cross. See, communion is just a simple representation of what he did for us. We say it almost every month, that the communion, yes, communion, as we partake in it, is nothing more than grape juice and a little wafer. So much more than that. See, when Jesus sat down with the, the disciples and he, he broke the bread, he said, Take eat, for this is my body which is broken for you. And he took the cup and he said, Take drink, for this is my blood which is poured out for you. See, there's a difference between pouring and spilling. I love this representation. Jesus was so intentional. That his blood was poured out for us, not accidentally spilled out. Someone that is that intentional deserves to be at the center of our life. 